You know, our dishonesty, in a lot of ways, comes back to haunt us, doesn't it? Anything we're dishonest about, whether we're dishonest with other people, whether we're dishonest with God, it has a way of coming back to haunt us. Maybe you've heard the story about the Russians in World War II who, in my opinion, had an epic failure. They heard about the rise of what was happening and all the people that were engaging in World War II, they, so they decided to train dogs to chase after tanks. Now what they did is they laced the dogs or filled the dogs full of mines, bombs, okay? So they take Fido, right, deck him out with bombs and then train him to chase after tanks. Now how they trained them was by having the dogs associate the underside of tanks with food. So the dog got pretty smart. They figured out, okay, if I chase a tank, go under the tank, food will be there. Their tactic they thought was perfect. Sure enough, first day they enter World War I, or World War II, excuse me, they send these dogs off to chase the enemy tanks. Well, the sad part is, is that the dogs had associated Russian tanks with food, not enemy tanks with food. <laughs> And so they release these dogs with the bombs on them, and all of a sudden the dogs turn right back around and start chasing the Russians. Epic failure, in my opinion, right? Sure enough, a whole squadron had to retreat as they ran from these little dogs. The enemies just had to be like, that was awesome, that was great. (laughs) Failure. We have failure in our life. Failure as it relates to a job, maybe it's a relationship, maybe it's some kind of big failure that exists that you can think back to right now and go, man, if I could go back and change that thing, I would. Perhaps there's some kind of failure in your life that's just repeating. Every day you wake up and you're, no, not again today, I'm not going to do it today, and all of a sudden, by noon, you find yourself right back in the same mess. I would like to journey today into a land of honesty A challenge to you, if I can say it that way, that you would become absolutely brutally honest about the things that you failed at, but about anything in your life, and not just honest with other people, but honest with God. What would it look like if you absolutely shared everything with God? You might be sitting here today going, I really don't have a problem with that. I do share everything with God. But do you really? I mean, do you really go past the surface level prayers, even the medium kind of deep prayers? Do you really go to the depths of depths in your honesty with God? My hope is today to unpack some passages that will give you practical ways to be absolutely gut-wrenching, honest with God. I'm going to be honest with you. Is that okay? Can I do that at the start? This is not a fluffy sermon. It's not an exegetical sermon. I love exegetical preaching where we stick into a passage and follow it right along. This is a topical sermon, but it's not fluffy. We're not going to laugh a lot. Marshmallows aren't going to fall from the sky, right? It's not going to be this one where you go out feeling really good, but it's going to kind of feel like a doctor's appointment where you get a shot and you know that it was good for you to get it, but you didn't really want to get it. It's kind of like that. And I struggle to even give you a sermon like that, but I walk in obedience now to give you what I believe God has for our hearts today. Will you pray with me before we go any further? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, there is a piece of me that is greatly distracted by what I want to say versus what I know it is that you have me to say today. I pray, Father, that I will be obedient, that I will be a tool in your hand used to work on the hearts in this room, mine included. Lord, I pray that deep will call to deep today. The deep part of our hearts will be called to the deep part of you so that we can have greater communion with you and leave this place different than how we first entered. We love you and we trust you with this time. In your name, amen. So the question on the table is this. Are you honest, specifically with God? Or do you hide in your dishonesty? Are you honest or do you hide in your dishonesty? Perhaps it would be helpful if I first defined honesty. Here's a definition of honesty. Free from deceit and untruthfulness. Completely sincere, simple, unpretentious, and unsophisticated. You've met that kind of person, right? You've met the person that's just absolutely honest. They're just raw with you. And at times you even don't like that they're honest. It kind of rubs you the wrong way. And you're like, wow, I can't believe you just said that to me. But I strangely like it. You know what I'm talking about? That, that person that just says everything and, and it just comes out and they're sincere and unsophist, unsophisticated and, and they're honest, authentic. Here's what honesty is not. 
Honesty is not like that guy who streaked at my high school football game from one end of the field to the next as the rent-a-cop chased him down the field only to have him crawl in his friend's car and squeal off at the other side. Honesty doesn't bear things just for the sake of grabbing attention or to shock. Honesty is not an end in and of itself where we say something just to shock, grab attention, expose, give something to the public that shouldn't be. I've also grown to believe that honesty is not an end in itself. We often think, well, if I'm honest, I at least got it out and that feels better. I said what I needed to say. It's out, it's there, I'm honest. And we treat honesty as an end in itself. Here's what I think honesty is. Honesty is facing reality. It's the first step towards truth. It's exposing what needs to be exposed to God. It's not always fun. It's often messy. Sometimes it's even brutal. But I also believe that honesty is a means to transformation. I remember where I was sitting in a college class when a professor said at the beginning of a two-hour lecture, honesty is not an end in and of itself, but a means to our own transformation. I didn't hear anything he said for the next two hours. I mulled over that statement, drew it on my paper, doodled around it, thought, could that be true? Could honesty actually be a means to true and lasting transformation? Because if we're honest, we say things just to get them off our chest or to shock or expose, but could it actually be a tool in God's hand to form our life? I ventured down this road of starting to be honest with God, sharing everything with Him, not holding anything back. It was sad for me to even realize that I was holding things back. But I started being honest and expressing everything and then honest with other people. And then I invited other people to be honest as well. I said, you try this. You be honest with God or other people and see if it changes your life. And sure enough, friends started coming back and saying, this is crazy. When I'm honest, things change. So then I put together this little postcard. On the front of it, it said, if you could say anything to God and be sure you wouldn't be sent to hell for doing so, what would you say? put a return address on the back to a little P.O. box I had in downtown Chicago, and I started leaving these postcards everywhere. 7-Elevens, airport bathrooms, back of churches, in hymnals, in books, in bookstores. I left them everywhere. Suddenly, the postcards started to come back. They were mailed back to me, people saying honest things to God that perhaps they'd never said, yet alone written down. I don't know if people were changed by that. But I like to believe that by them simply speaking and being honest about the things in their life, that transformation began because it's happened for me. So this idea of being honest to God has become a life theme for me. It's what I, it's what I speak about. I've written about it in a book form. I, I, I have a ministry about it because I want to continually call people to be honest to God because I believe honesty can be a means to transformation. But let's be honest. There are six at least, roadblocks to our honesty. There are things that stand in the way of why we're not honest with God, and I would like to unpack those for us today. The first, I think, is simple and clear. It's that of guilt. We have guilt in our life. We have shame in our life, and it causes us to not be honest with God. Guilt and shame builds a wall around our hearts, a fortress around our hearts that doesn't allow God's love and unforgiveness to come in. And we go on in our guilt and our shame, afraid that God's going to find out what we actually did, and so we aren't honest with God. Guilt is a major roadblock in our honesty with Him. Guilt is something that's tied to the past. It's something that we wish we could go back and change or do over. Shame is often a feeling tied to the present, something we feel right now, or maybe something we're stuck in and we can't get out of. Think of Adam and Eve, all the way back in Genesis chapter 3. Remember them? In Genesis chapter 3, after they'd been created and told not to eat of the fruit of the tree, then they went and ate of the fruit of the tree. And after they did exactly what God said not to, they hid themselves. In verse 8 of chapter 3, it said, And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord. You get that? They hid themselves from what? The presence of the Lord. The very intimacy that they were experiencing and having and enjoying with God, they were now hiding from Him. And 
Here they hid among the trees in the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? He asked him, where are you? Pop quiz. How many of you think God knew where they were? <laughs> like, the, he knew, right? But yet he asked this question. Where are you? I believe in this question he's giving an invitation. Expose yourself. Come out. Stop hiding in your shame and guilt. Come back into communion with me. But Adam replied, I heard you. I heard the sound of you in the garden. And I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. We have these feelings of shame in our life that we hide ourselves and we cover up and we don't expose what needs to be exposed. Why? Because we're afraid. And let's be honest, this happens in our relationship with God all the time. It's a roadblock to our honesty. I remember the story my mom told me about a time where she hid some things. So I asked her if she'd do an interview with me in my home office in front of a camera. And here's that interview. Let's watch this. Here with my mom uh, to tell a story uh, about her childhood when she hid some dishes uh, in the bathroom. Mom, take us away. Tell us the story. Take us away, Josh. <laughs> okay. This happened when my um, parents were having their 25th wedding anniversary. Okay. And they had gone off to Hawaii for a little anniversary getaway. And they came home and I wanted to have this big surprise party for them. So I had invited all of these people over from the church. And I had done my best at cleaning the house. But I, the one thing I just did not have time to do was to get all the dishes done. And I had lots and lots of dirty dishes that were all piled up the whole time they were gone. So I took all of those dishes and I put them in the bathroom in the bathtub. And so I thought, oh, that's okay, because I'll get them all taken care of once they get home. And after the party, they're going to be so happy that then I can go and do the dishes. So I had these all there and had the shower curtain pulled so nobody could see them. We only had one bathroom in the whole, <laughs> the whole house. And so here the guests all had to use that bathroom, but I knew that they wouldn't see these dirty dishes in the bathtub. But this one man went in to use the bathroom, and why in the world ever would have opened the shower curtain I don't know and if this was a big tall man he was probably about probably six foot four and he was bald as a cue ball but most of the time he would wear his toupee to church not even all the time not all the time sometimes he'd come totally bald <laughs> this night he had his toupee on and so he walked into the bathroom and went to the bathroom and then came out and announced to everyone at the party that the whole bathtub was full of dirty dishes that he <laughs> saw while he was in there. And I was just so furious at him and everybody was laughing and, and my parents were just so happy I had a party for him. They weren't upset at all. But I just awesome. could not believe that he had to, to uh, share my secret. And why? why? No <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Like, how tacky is that that he snips in the bathtub? How tacky? That's just disgusting. I'll never forgive him for that. <laughs> oh. but let's be honest. We hide dirty dishes in our life all the time, right? We pull the curtain and we hope that nobody ever finds them, especially God. There are things we hide from God and we're not fully honest for the sake of transformation. We're not honest because of guilt and shame in our life, but we're also not always honest because some of us feel feelings of depression in our life. Now, I know that depression is a real thing. I know that it plagues some of us in this room. You get so down and you can't believe you're here and, and you just feel the weight and the darkness surrounding you. You get to this bottom of your life where you just can't believe you got there and you can't help but cry out to God. And and when you cry out to God, it's not always for help. It's just, I can't believe this happened. Your depression and the darkness around your life keeps you in this thick fog that doesn't allow you to see the goodness of God. I remember the story of Hannah. Hannah was a woman who dealt with infertility, which is also a very real thing, but it plummeted her in her faith. Hagar is continually provoking her, saying, what about you? What about you? Why aren't you having a baby? Look at me. I had a baby. I had a baby. Look at you. You're barren. In 1 Samuel 1, 7 through 10, it says that therefore Hannah wept and would not eat. And Elkanah, 
Her husband said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? And why do you not eat? And why is your heart sad? Am I not more to you than ten sons? If you live with somebody with depression, you know that you can't do anything at times to snap them out. You'll try so hard to say, listen, it's not that big of a deal. What about me? Our poor husband here is going, listen, what am I, chopped liver? You don't even love me? Am I not more to you than ten sons? You're, You're crying about not having a baby, but what about me? But she couldn't even see past that. It says in verse 10 that she was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. Listen, some of you are mad at God because things didn't work out the way you thought they should. Because God's not giving you things the way you thought they should be given to you. And so now you're depressed. You're past anger. You're past mad. You're just downright depressed. And your depression is serving as a roadblock in your honesty with God. Another thing that can be a roadblock in our honesty with God is pride. When we walk around thinking that we're the king of the universe, obviously that is not going to go well with the king of the universe. There's only one God, right? And you're not it, and I'm not it. He's the only true God. And so when we walk around prideful and we stick our chest out and we act like everybody else is lower than us, it's prideful and it gets you to this place with God that's just a cul-de-sac in your relationship because now you're fighting for who's going to be in charge and who's actually sovereign over your life. This is self-centered, looking only at yourself. And honestly, this becomes the root of many sins in all of our lives. But let me be honest about one more thing. These two things, depression and pride, are different shades of the same thing. They're both inward focused. Whether you self-deprecate or you stick your chest out and act like you're the king, you're looking only at yourself. And until you can put that away and say, God, I need you, you are king of the universe, and and really be crushed upon him, you won't be able to be transformed. Think of King Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel chapter 1, 2, and 3 was warned about his pride. Don't be prideful, don't be prideful. And finally in chapter 4, God has to turn him into something that looks like an ox. Here he is out eating grass. This is he has hair like feathers of an eagle, nails like claws. Can you imagine riding in the car with your kids? Hey, look, cow, cow, cow. Oh, King Nebuchadnezzar. Look at him eating grass. God humbled him. As he walked on the edge of his kingdom, thinking he was the greatest, God brought him down. Being stuck in your pride is a scary place to be, and God will do whatever it takes to humble you, or he will turn you over in your pride, and that's even scarier. A fourth roadblock to our honesty with God is that of fear. We can have all sorts of fear in our life, but with this I mean mostly the fear that comes in our life related to other things in this earth. Maybe it's relationships. Maybe you're fearful that you're going to let somebody down or you're fearful somebody's going to come and get you. Maybe it's fear of failure. You have this view of life that's just horizontal. You're not thinking vertical. You're afraid all the time. My brother said to me a while back, Josh, Do you fear God or are you afraid of God? It's a bold question. The truth is there are times that I probably am more afraid of him than I fear him, meaning I have a righteous respect for him. The same thing is true of anything else we fear in this life. We're not supposed to fear things. We're supposed to fear righteously only God. We're not supposed to run always afraid. But our afraid status can keep us from being absolutely honest with God. Think about the Apostle Peter in John chapter 13. Here he says to Jesus, look, I'll lay my life down for you. But then five chapters later, he denies Christ three times. Why? I believe a lot of that was because of fear. Fear maybe of being killed. Fear of being associated with Christ. Fear of what that girl at the gate would think of him. Foolishness, I know. But but a real roadblock to honesty. Another roadblock in our honesty is that of anger. Anger can keep us from being absolutely honest with God. Yes, we can have anger at other people because of what they've done to us, but this relates to anger with God. Let's be honest. There are times when we're just mad. God, I can't believe it's happening this way. This isn't how it's supposed to be. You didn't even ask me. This is where I end up. And we start spewing off, maybe not with our mouth, but with our heart towards God, just like Jonah did in chapter 4 of Jonah. 
You think of the story of Jonah as this hero who lived through whale stomach acid. Yay, Jonah, and preached a seven-word sermon and a whole city turned, and we forget about chapter four. Where all of a sudden here in chapter four, it says that he was exceedingly angry because he was displeased with what God did. I knew you would do this, God. And starts yelling back at God. And then he says, oh Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And oh, how gracious was the Lord. To not say, you know what, I'm done with you. Or go ahead and take your worm and your plant and your booth, and I'm leaving. But God asks him a simple, and I believe gracious question. Does it do you well to be angry? Really, Joni? Uh, You're just going to be mad at me? I did exactly what I wanted to do. I saved an entire city. Yeah, they were your enemies, but I'm God and you're not. Don't be angry. I believe you can be angry at God. I believe that that anger is an emotion that God gave us. So go ahead, be angry at God, but it's not okay to stay there. Because if you stay there, you will continue continue to grow in your bitterness towards God and will not be transformed. Finally, denial. Denial. Denial is a huge roadblock in our honesty with God. This place where we deny what's going on, we deny the sin that's in our life, we put up all these images in our life that we try to portray to God, that we got this all together and I'm okay. We pray before meals so we portray this image that I'm grateful, God. I said, thank you, God. Or when we sin, we say we're sorry, so we're sorrowful. At times we even try to portray to God, look how useful I am, God. Look at my gifts. You really couldn't be God without me. We'd never say that, but we borderline think that. Or how insightful we are. God, look at what I found in your word. Look what I found in your word. He's like, I wrote that. But yet we try to convince him that we're insightful. Images that we try to portray to God. We try to portray images to other people in our denial. Showing them, look how able I am. Look how stable I am. Look how knowledgeable I am. Fashionable, personable, on and on. Look at how able I am portraying what we want other people to see, but all the, t- all the while behind the scenes falling apart. Listen, Christ came to die for our souls. He didn't come to die for our images. So why do we try so hard to save our image? And that's not what he's after anyway. He longs for honesty. So what do we do with this? How do we come to a place where we can actually, absolutely be honest with God for the sake of transformation? I believe it starts by accepting these things, not just acknowledging them as a part of your life. There's a difference between accepting and acknowledging. You can acknowledge these things and say, God, this is the way I am. I hope you're okay with that. Love me anyway. That's acknowledging. Accepting is coming to a place and you say, listen, this is where I am and I accept it and I hate to accept it. But the truth is, some of those signs, they represent me. And I need you so desperately to change me. Come in and fill the holes and the cracks and the crevices in my life with your holiness and your goodness and your perfection and your forgiveness. We see all throughout the Bible examples of people coming to the Lord and accepting the things that really are and then asking God to change them. We see it in the Psalms, we see it in the Minor Prophets, we see it in Job's story, we see it in Jeremiah's story, we see it in Paul's story. Here's how I think we can be honest with God for the sake of transformation. I'm going to give you something real practical that you can do in your own prayer life. It's simply following the model that is laid out for us in the Lament Psalms that we see specifically in the Psalms, but there are also other books we see this in as well. It's this model that I'm going to put up here on the screen. It's the model that the psalmist used for honesty with God. It starts by accepting and being honest with God. Then you get to this place where you remember God's faithfulness, and then you praise God for being God. You start with honesty, you remember God's faithfulness, and you praise God for being God. We see this all throughout the psalm. Psalm 51 portrays this, but also Psalm 73. It's a very clear picture of this. Here's Asaph, this temple worship leader, who can't figure out why all of the wicked people are being blessed. And here he is leading worship in the temple, and he's not being blessed. He says the prideful people are rolling around with necklaces of pride around their neck. They're getting the riches of this world. They're 
pulling up with their flat screen TVs and their Escalade cars. And here I am, a temple worship leader. What is all this going to, Lord? Why does it look like the wicked are being blessed? And then in verse 16 or 17, in Psalm 73, there's this thing that the theologians call an oracle of salvation. This transformation where he sees God as God really is and his entire perspective changes. He realized that his feet had nearly slipped and now he begins praising God for who he is. You see that? He's honest with God, even about his jealousy in there. He remembers God's faithfulness and then he praises God for being God. I believe that true transformational honesty requires also that you believe in the omnipotence of Christ and God our Father. That you know that they know all things about your life. You know that the Holy Spirit, God our Father, and God the Son, they are one God that know everything about you. They're all knowing. So there's nothing, nothing that you can hide from them. I went into this office of this professor that I love so much named Bing Hunter. He worked with me at a church. If you have a name like Bing Hunter, you're just automatically cool, right? But I'm telling you, this guy is cool. He was an older man. He had these cardigans, always these cool glasses Professor for years, he'd written just about as many books as he'd read. Went into his office, and his whole office is wallpapered with books. Often it was easier to find a stack of books to sit on than it was a chair. But I decided in my journey of honesty to go ask him if he thought that honesty really could be transforming. So I walk in his office, I sit down, and I said, here, I want to know, Bing, do you think that if I'm honest with God, he can changed me. Like if I told everything to God that he could really, really transform me. And there was this pause. And then he leans across his desk and he said, what can you tell a God who knows everything? Feeling somewhat awkward, sheepish. I just scrounged up an answer. I said, nothing. I guess, I guess, you, can, I guess you can tell him nothing. And he says, no, you can tell him anything. Because he knows everything. There was this long, awkward pause. And I just excused myself. (laughs) And I walked out of his office, mulling over that statement and thinking about it for days and days after that, going, wow, I can tell him anything because he knows everything. We know that, but we don't do that. You can tell him anything because he knows everything. He's not going to be shocked. It's not like when we get a surprising email, we're like, wow, I never saw that coming. God is never like, whoa, she does that? I didn't know that. Whoa, he really thinks that way? Hmm, that's a surprise. It's not our God. That's a small view of God. God's big enough for your honesty. God's big enough for your life. God knows everything about you. So when you're honest about these things, he can begin to transform you. When you're honest about your guilt, you can come in and say, listen, no more guilt, no more shame. It's time for freedom in your life. Let me give you freedom. Galatians 5.1 talks about Christ coming for the sake of freedom. He didn't just come to give us eternal life. It says for freedom Christ came to set us free. You don't have to be in the bondage of guilt and shame anymore. You can be set free, but it means you open up your hands as filthy as they may be and you say to God Almighty, look at me, I'm a wreck and I need to be washed clean by your spirit. And when you do that, I believe he can come in and he can wash you and make you free. As it relates to depression, when you're honest with God about the things you're depressed about, when you're honest about your depression, then he can come in and he can turn your depression to joy. You can say, let me give you sweet joy. Notice the sign doesn't say happiness. It doesn't mean that he's going to make everything happen perfectly the way that you may want it to go. But in the midst of the circumstances that may be displeasing to you, he can bring sweet joy. I can think of all sorts of examples about this. Elijah, who was depressed and wanted his life to be taken, but God brought him back to joy. Hannah, who I mentioned earlier. The Apostle Paul, or even myself of times where I've been in such deep depression, so down that I can't pull myself together. I remember walking in the darkness in Chicago in the rain, and I always love to walk in the rain because you can't tell the difference between teardrops and raindrops. And I would weep and cry and was so sad. And it's not that all my circumstances changed, but suddenly in my crying out to God, he comes and he inserts joy right where I need it the most. 
or about a year ago, or two years ago maybe now, was so depressed because of some things that were going on in my pastoral ministry that I would lay on the floor in my office and could not get up. I swear if you would have picked me up, there would have been an imprint in the carpet of my body because I felt like the weight of the world was on me. And at times I would say, God, the darkness and the weight of this depression or these depression feelings is so thick, just let it crush me. But by being honest with him and saying, I need your help, he comes and he scrapes me up off the carpet and he inserts joy. I know this is thick for some of you and some of you are dealing with that and I'm telling you, be honest with God. Yeah, you may need to get some help and yeah, meds may have to help you clear the fog, but I would like more than meds, more than doctors, more than shrinks, I would love for you to come to the place where you run to God first in your depression and not to other helps. When you're honest with God about pride, he comes in and he turns it into humility. He comes in and he says, listen, I want you to be humble. You see, the Bible nowhere says have humility, but it does tell us to be humble. And remember 1 Peter 5.5 5, where it says God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble? I never want it to be said about me that God opposes me. But man, do I need his grace. So I want to be the person that God can look to and And yet, even though I have prideful moments, he comes in and he says, let's let's undo that. Let's change that. Let's put humility in there. Let me show you that I'm bigger than you. I'm God. I'm in control. I'm sovereign. Trust me, please. And your pride is crushed when your trust comes up and humility comes in. When you live in fear, you desperately want comfort. And I'm telling you that there is a good and gracious God that if you will be honest with him, he can insert comfort into your life. You don't have to run afraid anymore. You don't have to have those moments where you're so afraid for your safety or your failure or what other people think of you. You can actually have true comfort in your life where you can cry out like the psalmist cry, you are my refuge, God. In the cleft of your hand, I find my comfort. If you live in fear, I know that it's a real thing and I know it can be a slave master in your life and it can control all sorts of emotions in your life. But I'm telling you, run to God and be honest about your fear and allow him to insert comfort. Anger. Anger at God is something that needs to be transformed to peace. When we live in this world in the midst of war, what do we want more than anything? Peace. We put bumper stickers on our car, we tweet about it, we put it on our Facebook page, we talk about peace in the midst of war times. If you're angry at God, you have a wartime mentality. If you're angry at other people, you're living in a wartime mentality. I'm telling you, change that and come to the place where you have true peace in your life. This means that you keep short accounts with other people, but especially with God, you keep zero accounts. You don't go down a list and say, God, I'm mad at you for this and this and this and this and this. When you're mad at him about something, you run straight to him. and You say, God, I need help with this thing. Please don't let it turn into bitterness. And we have a good and gracious God who can transform all of your anger into sweet peace. Finally, I believe that he can change our denial into authenticity. He can get us to a place where we're authentic about what's going on in our life, authentic about the things that need to be changed, And no longer are we trying to preserve some kind of image, but he can make us into the real, honest people that we need to be. Proverbs 12, 22 talks about lying lips are the very things that are abomination to the Lord, but those who act faithfully are his delight. I want to be God's delight. I want him to look down at me on earth and be delighted in my life. I want to be authentic so that his love and his grace can flow through to my kids and to my wife and to everybody that I know. I don't want to be in denial managing images. I want to be real. I want to be a clear glass full of God's love. Maybe maybe you've heard the statement before. An honest man needs no memory. I love that. An honest man needs no memory because he's not trying to keep track of all the lies and stories he told. He's just living honest to God. I would love for all of you to enter this week into a more honest relationship with God. I want you to take the things that may have been up here at first and now be honest with God about them so he can begin to transform you. And it's not always as easy as flipping a sign. I know that. But if you're honest, I believe he can transform your life. 
Let me give you a few practical things you can do this week, to be honest with God. First, if you're dealing with guilt and shame, then I challenge you to go read Psalm 51 at least five times this week. And don't just read it, but pray it. And ask God to transform you, just as David cried out after his affair with Bathsheba in that psalm, saying, God, cleanse me so that your holiness remains pure and so that I can enter in with you again. Maybe it would be good for you this week to write down some things about your life on paper. Write a letter to God. Be honest with God. Not a cutesy letter. Not a letter with little hearts over the eyes. Nothing that's real cutesy. Dear God, you're my best friend. No, be honest. Say what needs to be said. And allow the ink and the paper to show you right there what all is a mess in your life. And then give it to God and allow him to transform you. I challenge you also to spend some time with the Lord whether it's 15 minutes, 30 minutes, however much time your schedule can afford, but time where you're honest and you say everything that you need to say, but then be quiet and listen and allow his Holy Spirit to preach to you and come in and show you how he can begin to transform you. And finally, I realize there may be some of you today that are just stuck. You're like, man, I'm in a pit. I don't know how to get out of these things. Listen, the Christian life isn't meant to be lived as an island. We're connected to one another. There are believers who can help you that maybe you have some of the same struggles as you do, so reach out for help. And remember, the church is here to help you as well. I have the privilege of doing counseling, so does Stu, so do many of our pastors. We'd love to provide you biblical counsel and help you get out of the slimy pit that you've fallen into, dishonesty with God. I want you all to live honest to God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your grace. We thank you that you are big enough for our messes. You're big enough for our honesty. We thank you that you can reach into our fear and our anger and our depression and you can comfort us and calm us down. We thank you that you call us to be close to you when we hide in our guilt and our shame, when we're stuck in our denial, and we can't get past ourselves to see your true glory. You're so gracious, God. Thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ, as the means by which we can have an honest relationship with you. And thank you for having us live with your spirit day in and day out so that you can know the depths of our hearts and expose them to you as we're willing to open them. Please transform us, God. Please make us more like your son. Let us be people that portray the gospel clearly in every aspect of our life. Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters in this room that you will help them this week. As they go on from this place, that you will help them be absolutely honest, gut-wrenching honest with you, and that they will live a week different this week than any other because they finally owned up to things that needed to be owned up to, but they with great expectation looked for your hand to change them. We love you, Father. We love you so much. In your name, amen.